so our final speaker in this session um, is Bill Jordan from Baylor University with his title being Helping Engineers Flourish <coughs> by Giving Them Tools to Work More Ethically. Welcome, Bill. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, this is a topic that I'm very much interested in. I've taught engineering ethics for most of my 36 years of being a mechanical engineering professor at two different universities. So what you're seeing here is kind of the distillation of about seven or eight uh, lectures put together to look at some issues of how to help engineers be more successful. So one of the things I want to do is I want to look at three different ways we can do that. One is by applying engineering codes of conduct. The second one, some practical toolkits. And the third one, looking at ethical theories. Much of the toolkit material I've gotten has been from an, very, an excellent engineering ethics book called Engineering Ethics Concepts and Cases by Harris, Pritchard, Ravens, and others. Uh, th this is a group of people of which there's a philosopher, Charles Harris is a philosopher, uh, Pritchard and Ravens are, uh, were engineering faculty members, and they have some very useful practical toolkits, and this was the main engineering ethics textbook I used for a number of years through multiple editions. There's been a brand new book come out this spring that if I was teaching ethics this fall, I would use. It's, by, it's an intervarsity press book by Brew, Sherman, and Vanderleest called A Field Guide to Technology for Engineers and Designers. It's also an excellent book for practicing engineers to look at how do you make decisions as to what's the appropriate thing to do with respect to ethical decision making. So I would very highly recommend that book. If you're in a Christian university, it could be the actual textbook, but certainly it could be a supplemental reading for practicing Christian engineers or Christian students. So one of the questions is, why do we teach ethics to engineers? One of them is to try to make them ethical. Well, we're not going to make people ethical by teaching them engineer ethics. <clears throat> Another one that resonates with lots of engineering faculty is because <clears throat> ABET requires it. Now, if you're not an engineer, ABET is the organization of professional societies that accredits engineering programs, and that same group decides what should be in a mechanical engineering program versus an electrical engineering program, for example. ABET requires engineers to study ethics. So you could do it just because you've got to do it. I think there's lots better reasons than you've got to do it. The next one is you leave students without excuse if they deliberately choose to make bad choices. And that's not my primary reason, but I think that's a legitimate reason to leave pe give people the knowledge of how to act ethically. And if they choose not to, they can't say, well, I didn't know better. <laughs> but my main goal is to help them Students who want to practice ethically make the right choices in what can be very complex situations. <laughs> One of the ways is professional codes of ethics. <clears throat> Excuse me. They describe shared standards. So there's a generic one from the National Society of Professional Engineers, and each engineering discipline has created their own code of ethics. They're common, agreed upon standards of what is good to do. Now, I don't think they necessarily contradict each other, but the electrical engineering one talks about different issues than the mechanical engineering one. It gives confidence, I hope, to the public that engineers are working appropriately. There is a way to change the standards, and I'll show you <coughs> excuse me, two different ways standards have been changed. And it also provides a rationale to help an engineer if they have an unethical supervisor. It's one thing to say, boss, I don't think this is a good thing to do. It's another thing to say, boss, if you make me do this, I'm violating the code of conduct of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. And I think that gives you a little bit of a, a better way to try to resist pressure to behave unethically. <clears throat> Codes of conduct have changed over the years. One example is an area of great interest to me is sustainability. Sustainability engineers came late to. I think many engineers like myself are committed to it, but this statement in the National Society of Professional Engineers, that's what NSPE is, says engineers are encouraged to adhere to the principles of sustainable development in order to protect the environment for future generations. That was added to the code in January of 2006, not that long ago from people my age. 
<clears throat> Another time is sometimes engineers are forced by the legal system to change. Most engineering codes used to say if you have an engineering firm, you cannot engage in competitive bidding to get projects. Well, that's how most public institutions do it. And what happened is the Supreme Court in 1974 ruled that NSPE was being unethical itself in saying you can't go and engage in competitive bidding. So there's no requirement that you do that. If you as a firm don't want to do that, that's your choice. But the point is, engineers cannot call you unethical when the federal court says there's nothing wrong with it. So sometimes it's engineers are dragged against their will into making changes. One thing that is a very helpful, useful resource <coughs> is this what particular website. The National NSP has a Board of Ethical Review where they look at real world cases. They're not just looking at uh, theoretical things, but actual cases. They've taken the names out. It's usually engineer A and B or X and Y face this issue. And then they have a panel of experts who reviewed it according to the code. And I, I make my students to do some of these problems so they can look at what is a real engineer really going to face. Another one is the second section of what I want to talk about is what I call toolkits from uh, Harris Pritchard and Raven's book of various ways you could think about things. One of the issues is what are some of the kinds of considerations and are you going to use a particular method of decision making uh, or not? And I'm going to look at a couple of examples of that. One of them is the issue of there are facts that you know, but the big problem is there are facts you don't know. Some of them are not relevant, but some of them are very, very relevant. And that's one of the issues when you have complex engineering and it gets down to public policy areas, is there are facts which not everybody knows. There may be facts which nobody knows. And that can lead to serious dis disagreement as to what choices you need to be making. Another issue is you sometimes are trying to solve the real problem. So this next example is not an ethics example, but it's an example of someone who tried to solve the real problem. Now, my students are young enough, they don't know who Yogi Bear is. I know who Yogi Bear was. And he had a lot of interesting sayings, but this one is, if you don't know where you're going, you'll probably end up somewhere else. <clears throat> and if you don't solve the right problem, you're not going to make a real difference. So here is a real world situation, and I've seen the results of this in many times in my travel. <clears throat> it says, shortly after the upper floors of a high rise hotel had been renovated to increase the hotel's room capacity, the guests complained the elevators were too slow. Well, the guests were unhappy because there are more people using the same number of elevators. So his first thing he said is, let's find a way to speed up the elevators. That sounds like a good engineering solution. What's the problem? The problem is, given the current building they had, they had no way to realistically speed up the elevators. His next said, said let's find a location and design a shaft to install another elevator. One of the problems is, besides the fact it was too expensive and they could not afford it, if you stall another elevator, you're taking out room space, which was the whole point of the renovation to begin with. The problem is, they were thinking the problem here was the elevators were too slow. That was not the real problem. The problem was the customers were bored waiting for the elevators. They put when they put mirrors in all the waiting rooms. Another thing I've seen in high-rise hotels is there's almost always a big picture window where you can look outside and see the scenery. The, when they did that, the customers stopped complaining. The elevators weren't going any faster, but the problem was the people's impatience, not the rate of it. But this, while this is not a particular eth and ethics issue, it shows you you've got to figure out what's the real problem before you could find a solution to it. So one, another useful approach is what's called line drawing. <clears throat> line drawing says, assume you have a situation where you need to make a decision. You should look at what are some similar situations where one is clearly good, one is clearly bad, and see which one of those two is your situation closer to. And I'm going to give you a concrete set of examples uh, with that. 
There may be a gradation of activities where it's not clear uh, when you move from one to another. And sometimes you have to draw a line that's arbitrary. An example would be if you are buying stuff from another company, how much can that supplier give you in terms of a dollar value? Some places set a dollar value on it. The federal government is chosen the simple way. Their dollar value is zero. You are not supposed to take a cup of coffee from a vendor if you're a federal employee. I have a feeling at that level it's probably violated, but that's one way to do it. I think a useful analogy is sometimes in different places you live in the world, or maybe if, if it's cloudy, it's not obvious when day becomes night. But I don't think any of us would say that day and night were the same thing. You may need to draw a line. Let's look at bribery. Bribery is forbidden by every code of conduct. I'm quoting it from the IEEE electrical engineers, and there's some dot, dot, dots there because they say they're going to do a whole bunch of things. I wanted to mention this specific one. We, the members of the IEEE, do hereby commit ourselves to the highest in ethical ethical and professional conduct and agree to reject bribery in all of its forms. Bribery is certainly condemned by many places within the Bible. Proverbs 15, 27 says, whoever is greedy for unjust gain troubles his own household, but he who hates bribes will live. So I think we agree bribery is wrong. So now the, that doesn't really resolve the issue of when is a specific thing a bribe? So some of the issues is a bigger gift may be more likely to seen as a bribe. If they gave you the gift before you decide to buy from that company rather than after, you know, why did you accept the gift? Do these people have as good a quality as their competitors? And also just what's the cost of what it is they're giving you? <clears throat> so what I make my students do is respond to a series of case studies. All but one of these following case studies has been offered to me when I was a young engineer. So suppose you're in charge of purchasing something for your company. Supplier offers to do something for you. Which of the following is acceptable? You could use line drawing. You could use the professional codes of conduct. You certainly can use biblical principles like uh, we just, I just quoted from bribery. So let's look at some of these. Uh, what about giving you a pen set with a company logo on it? Does that sound like a problem to you? I don't have it in my pocket. I just picked up a pen set from somebody out there. You know, <laughs> I don't think they're bribing me to buy their books, particularly. <clears throat> uh, the one of these, the only one of these I was never offered is the second one. Give you free tickets and hotel rooms to fly to Jamaica for a week's visit to the company's manufacturing facility. I have known of people who have gotten offers of that nature. I think something like that could be considered extremely problematic. Are you really going to Jamaica to look at this manufacturing company's uh, factory? Or are you really going there to do other things? But that's an example to me, the first two. I don't think anybody has a problem with the first one. And I think virtually everybody in my class says this second one is not good. So let's look at some other ones. When I lived in Ohio, <clears throat> I was offered a free trip to Erie, Pennsylvania. Now, many of you may not care to go to Erie, but that's a separate question. <laughs> we went, were invited to see the company's manufacturing facility. They, we were, one of the things our company did is we coated steel, uh, sheet steel, and they supply, sold paint. So it was 250 miles away. We spent a night. We were offered to spend a night at their place and look at it. Well, yeah, was there some element of fun to it? Well, yeah, there was, and you got away from the office. Uh, I'll be honest, I, ex I and a couple of other engineers accepted that trip. We thought it was not that expensive, and it was, we could see more about how that company made what they made. I think that's quite legitimate. <clears throat> okay, take you out to dinner at a fancy restaurant. Now, when I lived in Mansfield, Ohio, there was a limit to what, how many restaurants were fancy, necessarily. If that would be true in Waco, Texas, where I now live. But <clears throat> my company basically said it was okay if you could consume it. Basically, you know, if you're talking about food or experiences. I don't think you're likely to sell out your company for a nice, fancy dinner. Now, some people in my, some of my students get a little bit nervous about that. 
But what about this next one? This is a, a, a higher cost, taking you out to an NFL football game. My students always ask me, well, what team are you talking about? <laughs> you know, this was uh, in Ohio. It was the Cleveland Browns. I have to say, when the Cleveland Browns were one of the best teams. Okay, They were a very good team at that point. <clears throat> so... Uh, you could argue that one might be borderline. Now, it was still close enough. It was not an overnight. So we did that. I accepted that one. The last one I was offered to twice, uh, going to a nightclub with new dancers. I turned them down. It was interesting. You may think when you go to another town, no one will know what you're going to do. Well, the two salesmen went ahead and took them to the nude dancers, and the two engineers did not go. Before I got back to Mansfield, everybody in my department knew I turned them down. So a purely utilitarian approach even is, besides the inherent immorality of that, is people will know what you're doing. Okay, ethical theories, uh, this part I was going to go through relatively quickly anyway, because I've talked about this here before. The idea is you pre-decide how you're going to decide. My students don't like this, to be quite frank, because most engineers aren't very philosophical. I think it's important. I make them all write a paper of what's my personal ethical system. And there's a variety of cases. Here's just some references you could see if you look it up. Uh, there's some of the classic ones about utilitarian, respect for persons, rights, and virtue ethics. I make no apology but the fact that I am a virtue ethicist and the idea good people make good decisions, fundamentally. There's one thing that I've learned, and then some people you look at divine command ethics. I'm commanded to do it by God, and then ethical egoism, I'm only doing it for myself. One of the things that most of my students don't think about, and I, to be honest, didn't think about this till I'd been to Rwanda several times with my students on engineering service projects, is using ethical theories assumes you have some degree of affluence and you're not working to survive. You know, if all you're worried about is getting enough food for tomorrow, you don't have time for this reflection, to be honest. So I'm not saying that uh, being good is just for rich people, but the more sophisticated ethical theories, I think you need to have some degree of control over your life, which there are poor people in Rwanda for that's not the case. So I'm going to just kind of skip through that virtue ethics goes back to uh, Aristotle. I first encountered it in Martin and Sinziger's ethics book, C. Bauer and Barry have developed an entire engineering ethics book developing a virtue ethics approach from a secular perspective, and they apply it to everything. I like that book, but I think there's more options than just virtue ethics, and I want my student to look at it. So I have them do some readings from that book, but I don't really want to say virtue ethics is all there is because that's not true either. And then I have them look at the classic seven virtues that have been attributed to Thomas Aquinas. And I think it's pretty clear to say if you live by those virtues, you're living consistent with the Bible. So I'm not going to say that virtue ethics is a Christian perspective inherently because I don't consider Aristotle to be a religious figure. On the other hand, virtue ethics can be defended from an explicitly Christian perspective. And since Baylor is a Christian university, I do that. And here's the example of fortitude, and there's quotes from Joshua, be strong and courageous, from Ezra, rise up, take courage and do what you need to do. So I've deliberately made this the shortest part of this presentation because I've talked about it to ASA and similar groups before. One of the things I struggled with putting this all together was I had a lot more than 20 minutes so if you look at my slides after they get posted, there's about 35 slides in this presentation, and at the back of it is about 40 more slides with more material. The other thing is virtue ethics, I think, supports the NSPE Code of Conduct. The first section says engineers shall hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. And that's the opening sentence in almost every engineering code of conduct, and I think a Christian virtue ethics perspective We'll support that. So in conclusions, our teaching can't make anybody ethical, but can you give you guidance for those who want to make ethical decisions and provide no excuses for those who deliberately choose to act unethically? 
And I hope to have provided some tools with the codes of conduct, with the toolkit, and with the personal ethical system as ways in which you can help yourself as well as engineering students and practicing engineers behave more ethically. Let's thank Bill. If you have a question, you can raise your hand and Nate or I will come to you. One, while we're getting to this one here, is Bill, have you ever had, like you gave some scenarios, are there any scenarios that either you accepted but now you wouldn't in retrospect, or you didn't accept, but you would now accept as an okay bribe or non-bribe? Uh, the only one of those decisions I would have reservations today, and it may be because of the inflated ticket price, is going to an NFL football game. I love football, so I, I'm not sure I would say yes to that today, uh, but I certainly have no doubt saying no to, to the new dancers. You know, one. <laughs> uh, yes, just wondering if you have examples with your students around the use of statistics and cherry picking of data. Okay, I don't have one with cherry picking, but I do have a statistics one where, assuming you're a quality control engineer, which what I was, and you need a minimum strength level for your coils, so you tested everyone five times, do they all five have to be above, does the average have to be above, does the minim minimum have to be above, the median above, or some other combination. So the answer is, that's where it gets really murky. You know, so I make sure that we have a statistics oriented problem. Now, the issue of cherry picking data, not really strongly, but they really see how it's not obvious whether some particular coil met the minimum standard because there's a variation in data. Thanks. So question over here. Yeah. How do you look at issues of cultural differences? Because what may be defined as a bribe <coughs> in a given context may not be seen that way okay. uh, in other societies. Okay. Well, because I've been to some other countries, uh, I'm sensitive to that, and we have, uh, I think, three lectures basically dealing with international issues related to practicing a code of ethics, because what's considered acceptable in some places, is certainly one example would be nep what's considered nepotism in the U.S. is considered normal practice in some other countries. So, yeah, we do talk about that. And it's for people who are Westerners, as most of my students are, that's a little hard to, uh, to get your hands around and understand that. But the answer is the standards are not universally interpreted around the world. And, and we definitely, that's an important issue because lots of engineering practice is around the world. Excellent. Michael? Uh, yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, I'm curious, I don't teach uh, the ethics part of our curriculum in chemistry, but it seems like one issue that might come up is uh, I might make something or enable something to be made that could be used for good or for evil. And if I knew it was going to be used for evil, it would be wrong for me to make it. Uh, if I, if I knew it would only ever be used for good, it might be permissible. I'm wondering how you, if your curriculum ever deals with questions like that. Well, one, there's no simple answer to that, but the, and one aspect of it is, uh, we do, from uh, Harris, Pritchard, and Raven's book, there are several excellent case studies on that very issue. So uh, we make the students at least think about it. I don't know that I have a, obvious answer to that because you could you could have someone take something you never imagined could be used for bad and use it for bad but we there are some good case studies out there and i think that's an important topic for the students to think through yeah a lot of good examples like dioxins and napalm things like that a question over there yeah, yeah. oh um uh this is probably might be more prevalent today than in, in the past but I think there's this idea that a lot of moral choices are simply opinions, not based on anything that's universal. And I don't, I'm wondering if you run into that at all or if there's pretty clear ideas. That you, you mentioned a little bit if there's a clear, um, clear good and clear bad, and sometimes you have to draw an arbitrary line, but do you ever have trouble getting to something that people agree as a clear good thing or a clear bad thing? Uh, uh, certainly, I think 
even at a Christian university, students are more relativistic than I am, for example. But I mean, in, in years of using that case study of the new dance, I've never had a single student defend that, you know, so even in, in a public secular university. Uh, but the, the answer is that that's a real problem or a potential problem. One of the things that I like to use is that uh, the Martin and Singer book is, for lack of a term, a very secular book, and they talk about there are certain universal norms of behavior, irrespective of culture, in terms of uh, treating people fairly and honestly. You know. Which book is that? Uh, is that in your um, notes? Uh, I just have to refer you to Martin Singer's book. That's not really in my extra material in my. Great. Is there another question? All right, let's thank Bill again. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of our speakers in this session. It's been great.